Hello and welcome to the program. I'm your host, Cheryl Keck. For the next two hours, we will be taking you on a fascinating journey into the world of gangs. From Detroit to Durham, from Phoenix to Florida and beyond, we will be presenting an overview on criminal street gangs, ideology, recruiting, membership, and initiation. We will also explore the history of gangs, major national gangs, gang identifiers, their colors, tattoos, clothes, hand signals, and graffiti. We will also cover criminal investigation, suppression, and prosecution of gangs. And we will show you how communities are teaming up with law enforcement to drive gangs and gang-related crimes, including drug trafficking and violence, out of their neighborhoods. And that's not all. Toward the end of our program, we will be giving you the opportunity to phone in your questions about gangs to a live panel of experts. But make no mistake, we are warning you that there will be many visual examples of the graphic violence associated with criminal street gangs. But through that and everything else we are about to present to you, you will gain a much better understanding about the problem of gangs. So grab a pad and pen and get ready as we take you through our special expanded training today titled, Gangs, an American Evolution. Oh, man, it's crazy, you know? I wanted people to be like, to look at me and be like, oh, no, man, don't mess with him, you know? He wrote deep. They're causing so much crime. They're, they're robbing people and they're, they're breaking in their houses and they're shooting innocent people and they're shooting each other. Now we need to focus on giving young people, especially young men in our cities, Better options than apathy or gangs or jail. Like when I started game banging, I was 10. It's constant pressure on them. Just lets them know that they can't get away with some stuff and they're gonna have to think twice about doing it. Dude, they can't do anything about it if we don't stop. They're always gonna have to look over their shoulder for us. I don't like the cops, I just don't like the law, you know? I would like now to introduce one of our expert law enforcement trainers who specializes in gangs, Sergeant Harold Rashan of the Detroit Police Department. Welcome and thank you for joining us. Good afternoon. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, I've been a police officer for approximately 20 years. Uh, I've been assigned to the uh, gang squad of Detroit Police Department and currently I'm assigned to the Organized Crime Gang Division. I also instruct and lecture all over the country. And you are also a trainer for the multi-jurisdictional counter drug task force training program and you train for us all over the nation in classes for gangs and we are bringing you this broadcast today in conjunction with MCTFT and the Federal Law Enforcement Training Center. So you ready? Let's go. I wanted everyone to first know that Harold is an author of a very fascinating book on gangs. It's titled terrorists in designer jeans and it gives a very unique perspective on gangs and your your take on this is that gangs are no different than terrorists absolutely when you look at the government's definition of terrorism and where it talks about assassinations kidnapping uh, hijackings gang members are involved in the exact same crimes they're uh, ultimate goals may be different, but the way they achieve those goals are the exact same way as terrorist groups do. And so I want you to look at them as not just gang members, but terrorists. Well, when you say the word terrorist, though, you have to admit that after September 11th, when you say terrorist, everybody pretty much has a pretty uh, good idea of what a terrorist looks like. But when the average American citizen thinks of a gang member, They've got to have that stereotypical image in their head of the clothes, the wrappers, the fancy cars, jeans, uh, clothes, and bling blings and all that. So they're not really probably making that connection gang terrorist. And they're not making the connection because they're not looking at the activity that they're involved in. Right now, the government is primarily looking at the Al-Qaeda uh, and terrorist groups overseas. But when you start looking at the activity that these gang members are involved in right here in our own backyards, you'll notice the similarities. They do the exact same thing as the terrorist groups. Well, there are legal definitions of what a gang is that help support your ideology of that and the title of your book. Um, why don't we go ahead and talk about what is the legal definition of a gang? Uh, legally, the legal definition of a gang are two, uh, three or four uh, 
individuals involved in criminal activity who have identifiers, uh, have gang names, colors, and symbols. Uh, my specific definition is two or more. And the reason that I say two or more is because I want us to take a look at these individuals involved in these activities when, they're, when they first start, not wait until it's out of control and then say that you have a gang issue when the fact of the matter is it starts somewhere. It's like having a cancer cell. Does one cancer cell mean you have cancer? Absolutely. Do two people that are involved in the same activity, wearing the same colors, the same monikers, if they're involved in the same thing, can we consider them gang members? Yes. And when we do, we attack the problem right away. Okay. Now, in order to move forward in understanding gangs, we first must look back and take a look at the history of gangs. Harold, why don't you run us through that? This has been going on longer than many people might think. Well, gangs have been in existence primarily since the beginning of time, mostly for ethnic reasons. They begin to band together, and once they band it together, they uh, propagate some sort of agenda of some kind. And today, they've uh, grown into wearing colors, and, and, and ethnicity has nothing to do with it, uh, because it has everything to do with the mighty dollar. Okay. Well, as we mentioned before, when we look a, uh, a lot about and think a lot about gangs, uh, we think about the stereotypical image of a gang member, as we just said, the colors, the fancy clothes, everything from the rap music to the bandanas to the luxury cars, bright, shiny jewelry. But as you are about to see, the stereotype does not necessarily fit the mold because the fact is there are many faces of gangs. Well, okay, so far we've covered the legal definition of a gang, the history of gangs, and the many faces of gangs, as we just saw. Now we are about to get inside the mind of a gang member. We traveled to Detroit, where we talked candidly one-on-one -on -one with a 16-year-old gang banger. We also shadowed a gang's task force agent to learn his strategy in fighting the problem of gangs. And, you know, when I found out about the gangs, you know, that there was groups like that where, you know, you like that, you know, they different colors, different set. You know, I liked the way they dressed at first. I thought it was cool. Then I was like, you know, well, I'm getting beat up already. You know, why? What's up? Why can't I help? You know, I got one. I met one of the Sudanios. You know, I, I liked, you know, how he acted, everything, how he treated his game, everything, you know, how he, like, how he, he talked about it, it made it seem like, oh, that's the shit, that's the life I want to live, that's the life I want to live, that's the life I want to live. I wanted people to be like, to look at me and be like, oh, no, man, don't mess with him, you know. He rose deep, oh, man, he's crazy, you know. How do I make money? Go stealing radios, you know, stealing feet, like robbing people. You know, usually wait till they get their checks, check cash it, wait outside the store and rob them. Now that I know how it all goes, how, you know, how it feels when you shoot someone, how it feels when you rob someone, something. how does it feel? Well, depends, like when you rob someone, it feels like, you know, well, hey, you know, he's. That person, was, I was too smart for him, you know. I was too smart, like, I could, you know, I got that street mentality. You know, if this, that's what the streets are, you know, if that's what the streets are, I could handle it, you know. I could make easy money like that. 
officer. But if we get in a, like a shootout with the cops in the streets, we usually probably would have better guns than them. Uh, it's not like, I don't like the cops, I just don't like the law, you know? The cops could be cool as long as they're cool with me. I respect them every time, you know? But we don't want to take over the people that ain't got nothing to do with it, you know? We just want to, like the other gangs to know, you know, we're the ones that are running this place, not y'all, you know? This is our city, you know? You're going to come to our city, y'all got to, you know, respect us. Dude, they can't do anything about it if we don't stop. I do, but then I don't, you know, because I'm, like, used to this life. And here in Detroit, it's just not like they'll kill you, you know. If you can, you can leave, they'll let you leave out, but it depends, you know. It's not like, but they'll treat you like, ah, oh, man, he, you know, he got scared. That's why he couldn't hang with us no more. He's scared, you know, he left. <laughs> My mom, you know, she'd rather see me, if I get into some problems with the law, she'd rather see me in jail than to be back in the streets. Because she knows that in the streets, I'm going to end up dead. Unfortunately, he'll probably he'll end up dead or in prison. Robert Sanchez sees firsthand on a daily basis the magics of the gang world performing their ultimate disappearing act. He admits Magic has enough tricks up his sleeve to keep him going as a gangbanger for a while. Get Kid's smart, though. He seems he's a, he's a leader. He's going to end up being a leader. He's got people following him. But Sanchez knows gangbangers like Magic, who are on a menacing mission to monopolize the streets of southwest Detroit, are following him down a dead-end road. He's going to end up in prison, or he's going to... The people who are following him are going to end up dead in prison. It happens everywhere. Sanchez is a task force agent with the Detroit Police Department and the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms. There are two different types of gangs in Detroit, really. There's a the Southwest Detroit Latino, Hispanic gangs who wear the colors and do all the typical gang things you see on TV. And then you got the dope gangs. They're completely separate. But make no mistake, where there are gangs, there are drugs. And where there are drugs, there are crimes. Violent crimes. I'd say 90% of the homicides, rapes, and robberies in Detroit is over dope. Sanchez has the stories to back up the statistics. All senseless, all tragic, but also real. They seem surreal. There was a bad dope deal went down, and they ripped off one of the get no, uh, But they were all friends in the same gang. Um, but they wanted to rip another one off, and uh, they shot him in the head. They cut up all his limbs and body parts, his head, his arms. His... And when the police got there, they tried to cover it up. They threw him in the dryer. That was pretty bad. Because the kid that got chopped up wasn't a bad kid. He just got caught up. Another one is when they burned down a house. A couple of babies got burned. The bad guy that was going to burn down a house ended up setting himself on fire. Just a lot of drive-bys, a lot of shootings. A lot of uh, there was an innocent girl killed a few years back, standing in her. Uh, she worked at a donut shop. She was standing in her window watching the fight go down, and she caught a bullet. For a gangbanger, it's all in a day's work. The bottom line is they're both. This is a business. The fourth Sanchez specializes in Latino gangs. His beat, Southwest Detroit. It's his home. It's where he grew up. And it's where he now sees more kids than ever before growing up in gangs. Well, a lot of them are born into it. You end up knowing them. I mean, I've been in, in Southwest for over 10 years. And you end up knowing them since they're 10 years old. Now they're 20. So you're like, you, know, you just end up growing up with them, seeing them getting out of, in and out of prison. And so they're just born into it. Born into a life of crime and violence that is suffocating society of its safety. They're causing so much crime. They're, they're robbing people and they're, they're, they're breaking in their houses and they're shooting innocent people and they're shooting each other. So how do cops like Sanchez fight back? It's a strategy that mirrors that old saying, keep your friends close and your enemies closer. Sometimes Sanchez befriends gang members like Magic. Other times he goes undercover. 
the way he sees it, infiltration leads to information, the type of intel that is instrumental in turning investigations into indictments. A tactic that's helping Sanchez take back the turf of the hard-working, law-abiding citizens who live here. Just keeping the, the intel with gangs is probably the biggest, biggest thing, the biggest thing to do. Um, find out who their family is, because if, if, if they're truly in a gang, then their brothers were gang members, their gang members, their kids are be gang members. That's what we see a lot in Detroit. You gain the intel, he says, by paying attention and doing your homework. If you know what you're looking for, if you know if you know what kind of tattoo they're supposed to have or how they're wearing their hat or their belts at or what kind of clothes they're wearing or um, what colors they have on, who they're with, indicators, identifiers, what they look, talk, their their codes. They're red, Lent counts to red, the Slovenians are blue. They'll come through, cross their name out, but 187 basically, we're gonna kill little roach. That's what they're trying to say. Graffiti is how gangs communicate, mark their territories, and mock and threaten their rival gangs. It's basically the newspaper for the gangs. You can read who hates who and who's going after who just by looking at the walls. But if you don't keep up with it, you lose it. Just like in any language, it's a language. Basically it says if we catch you over here, you're dead. Keeping up with it also means keeping a camera handy. That's why Sanchez and his predecessors are leaving a legacy. A legacy of pictures that are recording the days and the lives and the deaths of gang members. Kodak moments that have mounted into piles of photo albums like this one. It uh, got handed down to us from older officers who moved on or got promoted. They started a gang file. Files that have been handed down to a new generation of detectives who are driven to make a difference. Carried on a tradition, I guess, within southwest Detroit. And uh, over the last I don't know, 12, 15 years, it's become an invaluable tool. An investment officers have made on their own time, on their own dime. Just taking Polaroids with their own money and their own time, develop, develop them on their own salaries and just categorize them by gangs, by last names, by nicknames. An investment that's paid off. People from all around ask us about our photos, our, our, our files, our gang files. files. If some agency is looking for a picture or a nickname, it's a pretty good chance that we'd have it. Sometimes the pictures help ID kids on the streets. We get the kids a lot when they're, when they're small. And a lot of times they're not in the system fingerprint or not fingerprinted, and they've never been arrested, they've never had any contact with the law except us. All we did was stop and investigate take pictures pictures that sometimes bring closure to cases at the county morgue if it's a John Doe or a Jane Doe you know you could go out show people the pictures you know just a face see if we can ID them most of the gang members and wannabes have no problem striking a pose for the camera in fact he says many gang members are happy to publicly pledge their allegiance to their gang we never had any problems people refusing to take them or anything. But eventually the pictures come back to haunt them because they're used to hunt them down. Well, a lot of these gang members, what they do is they, when they shoot at each other, they don't, nobody makes police reports on it. If they, so if they're shooting each other, they'll just say, say some guy gets shot on a corner, or he'll just say, well, I don't know, I'm walking down the street and I felt a sting in my leg. Um, so what, what do you have? But what they had was the intel from the photos and the files. Intel that was about to pay off big time. We had a string of them, probably 15 of them, of shooting at each other, but no victim versus complainant type incident. So we were able to interview a lot of them, because we knew a lot of them through the files and just through the streets. And they would admit that they had a gun but they didn't shoot. Or they had, or their buddy had a gun and he didn't shoot. We basically got them to admit that they were in possession of a weapon. A lot of them were convicted felons. Bingo. Right there, you can indict them on a, a federal charge, a felony firearm, or um, there's a bunch of other charges you can go if you're a convicted felon in possession of a firearm. Just being in possession is a charge, even though they say they didn't shoot. Um, or if they shot back in retaliation. Oh, we got a lot of them tripped up that way. In fact, it was one of their biggest gang breakdowns ever. 
So to what does Sanchez credit that success? Follow-up commitment. And sometimes a computer. Gang members communicate online. So Sanchez often logs on, hitching a ride on the superhighway right into their world. Gangs of the internet is like uh, graffiti. A lot of these uh, little internet sites have shout out boxes or um, forums you could go onto. Sometimes they even say where they're going to shoot each other. Or, Let's meet here and we'll have a fight or shoot out or whatever. You know, 13, like their nicknames Little Crow. This was a good bus here. Sanchez sees the computer as a long arm of the law, reaching the bad guys without tipping his hand. It's just another uh, investigative tool that I don't think they're totally aware that we're aware of it. But what he is all too aware of are the lives gang members are stealing, especially the children being robbed of their childhoods. The youngest gang member um, that I've come in contact with was probably about five or six. He was in the cash flow posse in Detroit, you know, um, to wearing the colors, throwing the signs. He ended up dead at, I want to say he was 21. By then he had been shot 11 times, stabbed like four times. He walked around the colostomy bag on him, still robbing people. And they robbed the wrong person, like I said, and got shot in the face and dead. Good guy, they buried him in a cardboard box or a wooden box. And you know what? He was like every, any other kid, like Magic earlier, would talk to me. Personal, every, all the police officers knew him. But you just sometimes, we, you have charged him over the years with felonies, but he gets out, you know, vicious cycle. You get charged, you do your time, you get out, you do more crimes. You get charged, you do your time, you get out. There was no way out for him. But what's the way out of this vicious cycle? The court system. Judges. People go, get charged with four or five armed robberies. Picked out on armed robberies. Gang mem known gang members. I'll go there and testify, say yes, they are gang members. This is why this so-and-so and so. -and -so. Um, the judges will give them like 10%, $10,000 bond, 10%. What are you going to do? You did, you did our job. <laughs> it's up to the courts. And it's up to him to keep holding his end of the bargain with diligence, determination, and dedication. You have to want to do it. You have to actually give, actually care.